Uh, so I'll first go ahead and give an introduction to myself. My name is Trent Butts. Like I said, um, I'll be the mod moderator for the hockey analytics panel. Uh, we'll be going from 2.30 to, I believe, 3.15. Um, and just so you guys are getting geared toward questions early, I'll say that uh, we're planning to do about 30 minutes of discussion, and then we hope to open it up in like the last 15 minutes to do some Q&A. Um, but we'd love to take Q&A questions throughout the entire panel. So if you have anything, you can go ahead and use the Q&A function and drop your questions in, um, and we'll try to get those going. Uh, joining me today are Katarina Wu, who is a data scientist for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, we have Namita Nankumar, who is uh, the senior quantitative analyst with the Seattle Kraken. And we have Allison Lukin, who has been with us in conferences before. Um, so we'd like to have you back, Allison. And um, she is uh, an analyst with the Seattle, Seattle Kraken, and she's a contributor to Root Sports, excuse me. Um, so uh, I'd like to allow um, all three of our panelists the opportunity to give a little bit of a deeper introduction, um, if they'd like to talk a little bit more about what they're doing. Um, and like what you've done in the past, how you got to your position. Um, I think that'd be great. So maybe we can start with Namita, if that's okay. Sure. So yeah, I guess the, the cliff notes about me are that I grew up in the Philly area, a big sports fan, uh, uh, but especially loved watching football, hockey, uh, and baseball. And then uh, when I went to school, um, I was a Wharton undergrad, so technically my degree is in econ, but really I just tried to study as much stats as I possibly could because I found out pretty early on that that was my favorite subject. Um, and then in my junior year, I had the opportunity to do an undergrad thesis, which could be on any you know, subject that I wanted. So before that, I had been kind of a marketing analytics research assistant, and I, I like that okay. I especially love the research aspect of it. Um, but in choosing my own topic, I figured, you know, why not do something I love? So I decided to pick a sports topic um, and delve into draft strategy uh, with regards to the NHL. Um, and at that point, I just kind of took a shot at just sharing my research publicly, submitting it to a conference in Vancouver. I thought no one would care at all, but to my great surprise, people did. Uh, flew over to Vancouver, presented that, and that kind of springboarded me into uh, doing more research uh, and presenting it at different conferences, sharing on Twitter, et cetera, um, which was a great way to kind of build um, my portfolio and just get noticed um, across sports as I found out because I was able to get in touch with um, the uh, analytics department at the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, who were coincidentally my favorite team since childhood. So that was awesome. Uh, and then I was able to work for them for a couple of seasons after graduating as a quantitative analyst, um, and then eventually ended up in Seattle uh, because working for a brand new team was just too cool to pass up. Um, I would say in terms of the work that I do, um, I've kind of maintained that interest in the amateur draft to this day. It's, it's definitely my favorite research interest, but also one thing I'm really uh, happy about and, and fortunate uh, to have done is a lot of research with tracking data, which is definitely one of the new frontiers uh, across sports, especially uh, in football and hockey. So th those are kind of my main research interests, but I'm sure <laughs> these ladies also agree that, you know, kind of when you're analyzing hockey in any capacity, you're, you're looking at all over the place. So I definitely also look at, uh, you know, play-by-play, -play, pro evaluation, all sorts of stuff, depending on what the decisions are that we have to make, uh, you know, at that part of the season. So yeah, that's me. Awesome, yeah, thanks so much. Um, we can go to Katerina. Uh, hi, my name is Katerina. Um, my path into sports analytics is eerily similar to Namita's. Um, she's actually one of like, my inspirations and in how I got into sports analytics in the first place. Um, so I graduated last year from UNC Chapel Hill. I studied econ, kind of, like, <laughs> um, and staff and computer science. Um, and then during uh, the summer of my junior year, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, go to the Carnegie Mellon Sports Analytics Camp, um, where um, it was like eight weeks of sports analytics, which was heaven for me. Um, and I. I uh, got to work on a project uh, about league comparisons um, in hockey with the Pittsburgh Penguins, um, which is where I got connections with uh, Sam Ventura and Nick Citron. Um, and from there, I just obsessively did many projects on hockey. Um, I wrote my thesis on um, like uh, 
on hockey again. <laughs> um, and uh, I did some other minor projects. Um, and I was really lucky that um, over the pandemic, the, uh, the Penguins offered me a position as a data scientist. Um, and I've been working there ever since. So very happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And then um, last but not least, I'd like to hear from Allison. Well, thanks for having me. Um, my story is a little different. Um, these two women are two of my heroes um, and they're two of the smartest minds in the sports analytics space right now. So I'm honored to be here with them. Um, I actually come at analytics from more of the storytelling side. So my education is actually in leadership studies, go figure. Um, and I was in corporate America for quite some time and was pursuing hockey as just following it as a hobby, but my brain wouldn't let me not understand what was happening. And that really drove me into a space where I started digging into analytics and the community was so helpful to me that I've started to do some research projects nowhere near as detailed as what these women can do and have done. Um, but I covered the Columbus Blue Jackets for many a year um, with an analytics, I like to call it data-driven storytelling focus. Um, and then I had the opportunity to not just cover a brand new team, but work with someone like Namita. And so I couldn't pass that up. And so now I'm doing writing for the team site and also doing on-air commentary for their game broadcasts. Awesome. Well, it's great to hear from all of you. Um, we're very lucky to have all three of you as panelists. And uh, I do think that the a little bit of the variance and backgrounds is a really good thing because it's going to allow us to approach this discussion from um, a few different angles, which is awesome. Um, so to start the real part of the discussion, uh, I think we would probably be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the huge changes in the hockey analytics, um, like the amount of data really that's available in hockey analytics and has become available over the past couple of years. Um, one of the things that Namita mentioned, which is great, is um, like puck and player tracking. Uh, so I think we would be interested to hear a little bit about how you guys have been able to use the new data, be it puck, player tracking, or anything uh, other, other than that um, in your day to day, and um, how has it factored in and how has it led to and caused the boom in, sport, in hockey analytics. So uh, we can start with Namita, but I'd love to hear all your perspectives on it. I guess I'll start by being kind of a bummer because one of the things that um, I definitely learned uh, in football, which has had tracking data, I want to say for at least like five years now, is that using all the data as exciting as it is definitely takes time. And, you know, thinking about just the process of modeling anything, uh, what you need is training data. So if you only have, you know, a few weeks or even a season of training data and you're trying to forecast, you're trying to predict something, um, you know, you, you just don't have enough data to do that. Um, and, and so that's a struggle that I kind of experienced in football and, and now here in hockey, it's, it's very exciting. And I think, you know, certainly I've already gotten my hands dirty just seeing what the data looks like and all of that. But it's also important to kind of not oversell, you know, how quickly things are going to happen with the tracking data. I think in every other sport that's gotten tracking data, you sort of see that it is a years long process um, and that, uh, yeah, that advancements don't happen overnight. And, and I think in all the sports where people are using tracking data regularly now, you're still seeing people, you know, building on uh, the research quite a bit. Uh, but the nice part about being relatively late um, in the adoption of tracking data as compared to some other sports is that we can steal from them, which is awesome. So one of my favorite parts of my job is just finding something that someone has done really well in another sport, like let's say soccer, which has a lot of obvious you know, similarities to hockey. And then just you taking that and using it and then feeling really smart because <laughs> no one did it in hockey yet. Uh, so I think that's something that's going to be really great, you know, as everyone continues to uh, use tracking data in hockey is that, you know, sports like soccer and basketball and even football um, have this uh, wealth of research already that we can draw from. Yeah, I agree. Um, a large part of my job with tracking, working with tracking data right now is just trying to build up that database um, like trying to get the data into a workable form. Um, like Namita said, is like it's a huge amount of data, and 
sometimes like I feel like my computer isn't well equipped enough <laughs> for it. It's crashed a couple of times because just the, the sheer quantity of it. Um, but I am really excited to have this kind of data available. Like um, it's allowed us to see hockey at a much more granular level where before with like the like NHL hits data that they provided, it was kind of like seeing hockey in snapshots where you sometimes don't even know like where the other players on the ice are um, or like who, who even was on the ice during a certain event. Um, whereas now you kind of get like a video form of the players that like still 2D. <laughs> yeah, and I think I come at it a little differently um, in terms of trying to share what we learn from tracking data in a more public space. You know, I appreciate Namita's points too about how long this is going to take. So for people who don't know, hockey analytics right now in the public space are all shot based. And so it's really, really, really limiting. I mean, we have really smart minds doing some extrapolation of other ideas that we can take, but that takes time because it's not automatic. So there's kind of a patience game in the public space. And then there's also, even when people like Katerina and Namita are able to complete the work that they've done, we're going to have the question of, is any of this going to be public outside of teams offices? And I certainly respect that proprietary knowledge, but in terms, you know, to Namita's point, the next big advancements are waiting for hockey analytics, but that's going to happen internally, but it also needs to happen publicly. Um, and so some access to that data, hopefully is a thing that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think it is uh, interesting and, you know, also promising even to hear that um, some of this data and some of our knowledge from it is going to continue like evolving over the next several years. And it's just going to keep happening as technology improves. Um, and I think that speaks to how, you know, hockey analytics is going to continue to grow, which is really exciting from the fans perspective. Um, and then Allison, you, you did mention a little bit about um, communication, like uh, you have a unique perspective, you're communicating to the public rather than communicating to someone within the department. Um, so I'd like to ask you first, but then I'd love to hear other perspectives on it as well. Um, what is the role of communication in uh, your job? And then how, how difficult is it to communicate these uh, often technical concepts to either the public, in your case, Allison, or to uh, department heads that are not necessarily, you know, quote unquote, as analytically minded in the other two cases? Yeah, I think that you know the the technical knowledge is honestly just as important as the communication skill. And I'm sure Katarina and Namita can speak to this too. My primary audience is the public, but even in the work I do, I have to interface with other media, I have to interface with players, I have to interface with coaches. And I know, you know, that's what people like Namita and Katarina and even, you know, we've talked about Sam Ventura, we've talked about well, we haven't talked about, but we should, Alex Mandrecki. These are people who have that communication skill set. We, it is incumbent upon us, if we are going to communicate, we have to find the language of our audience and use those terms. So if I'm talking to Namita or Katerina about something, we might go straight to XG and we might be talking in real shorthand with real technical terms or even saying, you know, what's the command in R or what's this or that. But that's not going to mean a darn thing necessarily to a head coach or to a reader or to a viewer of our broadcast. So I have to find words to say shot quality instead of XG or when a player does this, does it mean that? Um, and so communication is critical for me. Again, it is mostly public facing, but I think it's just as crucial internal to teams too. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that and just say like, you know, I think a, a big thing, um, I'm sure everyone can relate to this, like there's only so many hours in the day and there's so many things that we want to do, so many topics that we want to look into. But when you're working on a, a project and let's say you're building a, a model, you know, I, I think when you're, let's say in, in school or a more academic setting, like you, a lot of times the work just ends at like, okay, this is as accurate I could make as I could make this model before like, you know, I had to turn in this project. Uh, but in real life, like, it's a lot of like, okay, this model is pretty accurate. Like, should I spend the rest of my day, like, trying to tune it and make it even more accurate or try a few different things? Or should I spend the rest of my day, like, figuring out how I'm going to present this in a way that people will actually look at it, you know, and, and understand it and continue to reference it. And, and so more and more, I realized that, like, 
the returns on spending those extra hours on the communication piece of it are always greater than getting, let's say like a 0.001% increase in accuracy. Like it really is all about just like making sure that the stakeholders like understand kind of what they're supposed to do with your research. And um, I, I, a big thing I think is, is conveying confidence. So there's some recommendations that we feel especially confident about and, and how do we make sure that they understand that. And then there's a lot of decisions that we think are basically 60, 40 and like, yeah, we still want to do the 60 side of that. Um, but you know, maybe it's a little less, uh, prioritized or it's conveyed in a different way. Um, so yeah, certainly all of that is, is so crucial. Yeah, and again, with the being able to directly communicate what you mean, um, it's the most important part is that it has to be useful to whoever you're communicating it to. Um, so like if I'm talking to a coach or uh, anyone else within the Penguins organization, they might, they probably don't care if I use like a GAM model or a random forest model, but they would care like what that actually means. Um, so like, there is some kind of, like sometimes I, I would like to be able to say, you know, like these coefficients mean blah, 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 but that's not gonna be as helpful to them as directly saying like, these qualities are what we value um, in player instead. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, again, those pr perspectives are really appreciated because it's, um, it's pretty interesting to hear uh, how, you know, people, in different positions within a similar industry um, all deal with the problems of communication and um, it's something to keep in mind for especially a lot of the students in the audience who will probably find themselves in jobs and sports and um, you know keeping in mind that the, uh, the technical side is only as uh, important as the communication side. Um, so I do see a really good question in the Q&A here from Jessica. Um, I think it's uh, important that we touch on this if, if you guys are uh, interested um, you know from the perspective of women in sports um, would you be uh, comfortable to talk about, you know, what obstacles you may have faced, um, how you see uh, the dynamic of uh, women and men in sports changing as we move into the future? Um, yeah, whoever, whoever is willing can start. Sure, I guess I'll go by just saying that, you know, obviously there are a lot of challenges and, and frankly, I don't even know if I can speak to them because I mean, I feel like things have gone pretty well for me so far, but what I will say is that I think sports analytics is a great field for underrepresented minorities in, in sports at large to kind of break in because this is a field where, um, you know, I didn't like, I wasn't selling I mean, I was kind of selling myself, obviously you have to be a great communicator and stuff, but I was sending people my research. I was sending people slides that I had made, code that I had written, you know, reports that I had written. And it, none of that had to do with, you know, my race or gender. And, and so I, I think it's a great field where you can just point to this concrete research that you can do or articles that you've written rather than having to leverage, let's say like, you know, existing connections as much, um, or just saying that you've played the game. I mean, I haven't played the game. So <laughs> like, I think that that is what makes sports analytics in particular, a really great way, you know, for women and, and minorities to kind of break in because it's not bound by all of these sorts of traditional ways of, of breaking in or showing your expertise. Yeah, I mean, I think that Namita hits on such an important point, and that is, if I really think about it, I don't know that I would have gotten the traction that I got or have survived in this space without the analytics community. Not only is it a great place and a welcoming place for your work, um, but the individuals who I've come in contact with are so encouraging and welcoming and wanting to educate and collaborate in terms of thought sharing and how to process something. So I think that this is a really welcoming space, but the realities are um, that there is still a limitation, particularly on, on my side of the house, um, in terms of the expectation of how many women are gonna get a shot, um, how many people of color 
are going to get a shot um, because there's a lot of um, perceptions of, to Namita's point, have you played the game? That's how you know what you're talking about. Um, that's a real thing. And who do you know? That's how you get your foot in the door. Um, and again, I would give credit. I mean, I think it's so powerful that we see two women who have really significant roles with professional sports organizations and have, you know, Namita has been with an NFL organization. Other women are doing this in the NFL. And I think they are providing a landmark that we can look to because if you see it, you think you can become it. And that's important. And we're also seeing women in spaces, again, I'll mention Alex Mandricki, whose focus is on exactly what Namita said, who can do the work the best way. Um, and I would honestly be remiss if I didn't mention the Seattle Kraken organization because they are very focused on making the organization look like the community around us and trying things in different ways. And I think that when we see individuals trying to do that, we have to support that and acknowledge it. Um, but right now you do have to have a bit of a tough skin, at least in the walk that I've taken. That's honestly why I got into analytics because I needed to be able to prove I knew what I was talking about because it was too easy for people to think I didn't. And even um, it, I share some of these stories you know, over drinks with friends, but there are still times when people say, well, let me explain that to you or let me tell you what that means. And I'm like, I know what that means. Um, and there's still barriers, but I think um, this space in particular is very welcoming. We're seeing steps forward. And it has been my experience that every woman in this space, be it sports media or analytics, um, we are a small circle and we are very focused on helping one another and being a sounding board for one another and find those women and feel free to reach out to them and communicate with them and get advice when you need it in what might be a challenging circumstance. I agree that the sports analytics community has been super welcoming. Um, like there's the need of being like a trailblazer for me personally, <laughs> and I'm sure other women as well. Um, and like also like Allison for um, inviting me to speak at the Columbus Blue Jackets uh, conference um, a couple years, oh my gosh, a couple years ago. Um, and, but like the reality is that like in hockey analytics or in the hockey industry itself, there's like very few women. Um, aside from me, I think there's one other woman in the hockey operations department. Um, and, you know, like during the draft, I, I asked where the bathroom was and no one knew because <laughs> they, they were all men. So like, there is still like some, I guess like a barrier that it's not, it's not fully integrated is what I'm trying to say. Um, but I do think that they're making strides to change and it's really cool to be part of that. Yeah, thank you all so much for your perspectives. It's um, really appreciated. And I see that uh, Jessica appreciated your answers too. And thank you for your question, Jessica. Um, so Allison, you, you know, you brought up the Seattle Kraken organization. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that given that it's uh, such a hot topic, just starting their, their first season as a franchise this, this year. Um, and, uh, as Namita mentioned, uh, she actually really had the opportunity to get in on the ground floor um, with the Kraken organization, um, being hired on as an analyst as, in, as one of the first positions that Seattle actually hired out, excuse me. Um, so Namita, can you speak a little bit to how getting in on the ground floor of a new organization is different from you know, coming from the outside in your um, own experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I saw immediately when I uh, first got to the Eagles um, was that there was a whole robust, you know, operation, especially with regards to like game prep, that there were, you know, so many um, processes that had already been built out. And, and it was one of those things where I, I could try to improve some of them marginally, but really it, it kind of was what it was. Um, and, and that's a good thing to be totally honest. Like I did not want to go there and realize that like this analytics department that had existed for years hadn't done anything. So it was good, but also, you know, contrasting that with my experience in, in Seattle, like it's been great to really like make help make so many of those fundamental decisions on, on how we should operate and, and what processes should look like. And, you know, uh, I mean, we joke, like, instead of being beholden to like other people's mistakes, we're making our own mistakes. So it's great. Um, but yeah, no, it, I think, um, it, yeah, it, there's not much I can say beyond that. It, it's just been really cool to kind of see how things get built and, and not just try to sort of iterate and, and add on to, you know, someone else's existing work 
Um, and yeah, we're, we're doing the best we can, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly challenging, but I think, uh, one of the other nice things, as you mentioned, like being able to get hired so early is that we had a significant amount of time basically before we even started playing games, um, to kind of plan rather than just being pulled in a bunch of different directions, you know, as we kind of are right now, uh, with, with the season starting. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting to hear, and it'll be um, interesting to see how it develops too. Um, with uh, you know, not not exactly sure how the how the Kraken season will pan out, but I'm I'm sure the the fact that it's being um, decisions are being driven by data will ultimately help in the long run, um, as kind of a theme that we see. So um, you know, given uh, I'd really like to talk a little bit about what students can be doing now to prepare themselves for a career if they see themselves in your shoes in the future. Um, so, you know, Katarina, as a recent graduate, uh, you talked a little bit about um, the camp that you attended, and then I believe, if, if I have this correct, you also interned for a summer with sports media technology, um, which has been very instrumental in getting the puck and player tracking data to the NHL. So can you talk a little bit about your experiences there and what projects or what internships are going to be really good on a resume for students? Yeah, um, sorry, I totally forgot to mention that in my introduction, but yeah, I worked at s &T, which is the sports media technology which is the company that's um providing the nhl with player and puck tracking data um and i mean just first of all for like as a recent grad i think it's uh sports analytics is definitely growing um like even as like more and more colleges are adding it as a major um but despite that i would still say you don't have to major in sports analytics to get a job in sports. Um, the biggest, like, the technological side is definitely really important. Um, but I think that, you know, other majors, like even like, if you want to say like humanities, like English or philosophy, like, um, like we discussed prior, um, communication is really important and being able to think through these problems in a certain way will always be able to, uh, will always be helpful. Um, but the biggest, piece of advice I would have to say is have like a portfolio of projects that you worked on that with at least one thing that's kind of like an app or like something that a coach or um, just anyone on the team can directly use because like they're not going to be reading papers every day you know um, like a, it's definitely great if you want to go into grad school or something but most teams aren't just like reading papers nonstop in their free time. Um, so I think something that's like easily accessible for a team to like just be able to view the work that you've been doing. Um, I think that's really, really helpful and will definitely help you stand out. Yeah, and I, I agree with everything that Namita and Katerina have said. And I would add, you know, we heard from both of them in their presentations, building on that point of communication go to sports analytics conferences. Um, right now, just like this, they're mostly virtual, but hopefully we'll be back in person sometime soon. But even those that are virtual or those that have been um, in person in the past are starting to add data contests. So it gives you an opportunity to work with data, perhaps get some access to data that you might not otherwise have access to. And it builds all of those points we've made about being able to communicate, whether it's presenting an app that you developed or a website that you developed. You can start small, you can present a poster, and then maybe you give a talk, and then maybe you're part of a panel, and you're going to find ways to communicate your ideas and your thought process effectively. And as we've talked about, communication is going to be key no matter what you do. And if you're looking to go into the sports analytics space, to Katarina's point and my example, I had no formal background in any way, which led to what I'm doing now. And I think that if you do have the opportunity to work for a school paper or you know cover local sports, those teams, those coaches, those players are often much more accessible than you're gonna find when you get to a professional level. Offer to cover maybe a team that is looking for more coverage and deserves more coverage. I mean, the, the coach of the Ohio State women's hockey team is a dream. 
um, and she's an analytically focused individual and she will talk to you all day long. But again, hone those skills of thinking about how to analyze a team, analyze a player, communicating with that player, communicating with that coach, seeing how you can do that the best and then how you can present it the best. It's just like sports, right? Reps, 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 repetition is going to help you get really strong in those areas. Yeah, absolutely. And and the only thing I'll add to, to those answers, because I think they're perfect, is that, um, you know, I think especially when we look for interns or, or just hiring in general, um, the more sort of publicly visible projects are, I think the, the more compelling it is to a certain extent. You know, I know in, in other fields or jobs, maybe the, there might be more of a prioritization of like, oh, did you like intern for another NHL team before you came here or something like that. But as I said before, I, I think the, the great thing about sports analytics is it really is all about what you can do. So, you know, even if you've never had like formal experience working for a team or something, if you do what like Katarina is suggesting and just show like, this is what I would do for a team, it kind of doesn't really matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you majored in. It doesn't matter what your internships were. If we see that and we're like, yeah, we want this for our team, then that's like the biggest barrier to overcome. So I, I would just say like, don't worry too much of those kind of like formal like resume things that, that might be more important in other fields. If, if you show you can do the work, then we will believe that you can do the work. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can only echo that as well in my limited experience in college and, um, you know, being part of the uh, Ohio State Sports Analytics Association. It's um, getting work with even just these smaller uh, varsity level sports at Ohio State is, is really important. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that you guys brought those points up. Um, so, obviously, I want to I wanna keep this focused as a hockey panel, but um, for people that might be interested in other sports, uh, I know, for example, Namita, you talked about your work with the Eagles. Um, how do you feel like uh, or to what extent is it possible to transition in between jobs in different sports? Like, how was it? Did you bring over any skills from football that you can list explicitly? And do you feel like you could move on from hockey if you ever decided that you wanted to? Yeah, this is uh, always my favorite question because I always need to start by saying like, it is really hard to like work in different sports, you know, at this level. Like, uh, I will be honest that, you know, most of my research before I got hired by any team was uh, in hockey. So I kind of almost felt like a little bit more of an outsider um, in football and, and the Eagles like organization was incredible in making sure that, you know, I felt welcome and that I was able to learn as much as possible about the sport uh, because I, I was sort of, I was a pretty big fan of the Eagles, but I didn't have as much sort of general knowledge as maybe I would have liked going in. Um, but the, there are certainly benefits. I, I think the biggest thing, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier that like a big part of doing sports analytics research can be stealing stuff from other sports. You know, there are, I think uh, hockey and, and even football, you know, are, are not necessarily the most analytically advanced sports when you consider like baseball, basketball, and uh, like I said, even soccer. Um, so being, a, having more of a broad base of knowledge and being able to kind of pick and choose like, okay, this is a really interesting basketball concept that I think we can apply to hockey if we change X, Y, and Z, you know, that's a really great way um, to kind of bolster your skill set. And, and that's where like, I'm happy that, you know, I have had my experience in the NFL. And then also uh, my coworker, Danny, who's my fellow analyst that I work with all the time. I mean, he's a big basketball guy. And, and so having that range of experience, you know, we're always seeing uh, new and different research uh, and talking about ways to apply it. And we're not just confining ourselves to what's going on, you know, in hockey. All right, so uh, I do see another question in the Q&A. Um, someone asked, uh, how should someone go about looking for an opportunity in sports analytics, specifically in hockey? Should it be through networking or looking through job boards? I think you guys did touch on this a little bit, but um, I've heard that you know Twitter is a great place to just post your research if you have a Twitter following. Uh, do you guys have any experience with that? Namita has a pinned tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's a tough question because, you know, certainly anytime a job gets posted, like there's hundreds of applications and, and it can be hard to stand out in that regard. So I'm not saying like don't apply to those because we definitely do read all the resumes and, and stuff like that. But again, like I said, it can be hard to pop 
right, in that context. So that's where, you know, a, a less formal thing of, yeah, just like tweeting out stuff, uh, writing articles online um, is really the best way to kind of get noticed. And then maybe you don't get offered a job right away. Like I didn't get offered a job right away, but you kind of stick in people's minds as like, okay, the next time we have a position available, this person might be a good fit for it. And then I think that's really the way that a, a lot of people end up getting hired. Um, so yeah, I, I would just say, and, and you don't even have to have like a, a huge following. Like if, if you write something interesting and, and it gets shared, you know, some making those connections with people who can share it is helpful. But, you know, even if you have like 10 followers, but it gets shared to a wider audience, let's say on Twitter, like, I always mention that a big part of our job is to be really up to date on what's happening in the public sphere, because we have to make sure we're either caught up or exceeding what's going on publicly, right? Um, so, you know, never feel like that is a pointless endeavor because teams like everyone's got Twitter accounts and lots of burners out there. People are reading, I think, way more than you'd ever expect. Go ahead, Katerina. Um, and I would just say that like the biggest boost for me was actually speaking at um, the Columbus Blue Jackets Hockey Analytics Conference where after I spoke, I was approached by Andrew Thomas, who's the director of SM uh, data science at SMT, and that's um, where I like first got the connection to intern with uh, SMT over the summer. Um, and even prior to that, it or like following that conference, like other teams approached me as well. Um, just like having to put my work out there was definitely one of the biggest challenges. But like once you get to that step, I think it's a lot easier than if you had to like do like, you know, your own green party movement of your own work or something. Um, just. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I tease Namita, but it's true. She does actually have a, a pin. It's pinned. Is it right? Is that right, Namita? It's your yeah. pinned. It's pinned on her Twitter profile, and it answers this question really well. And I would just reinforce um, using this community. Namita's right. There are people reading my stuff. Sometimes, I, like I was in some in an event with a GM from another team, and they pulled up their phone, and it was someone else who had sent that GM my article. And I was like, what is happening? This is insane. But you don't know where your reach is, um, what, how it's all kind of spidering through the network. And to that point, you know, I, I know so many people who, when they come to their first analytics conference, listen, it's normal, we're nervous. You're walking, you're like, who are these people? I don't, you know, I personally am an introvert. So I'm like, I don't wanna have to talk to too many people, but the shared passion and the shared understanding of the work is a really great way to connect with people. It's not like you have to go and be life of the party per se. Um, it's a really welcoming space to discuss the work and find out what's going on. And, and as Namita said, people are going to remember that and they're going to remember your passion. They're gonna understand what you're interested in, what you're working on, even if it's not public. So again, using the community, both online and in person when it's possible is huge. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to hear that there's just so many opportunities for um, younger kids coming into the, into the industry. That's uh, pretty heartening. Um, we got another question from Max in the chat. I, I think I know some of the answers to this question, but um, what are the coding languages that you guys use in your day to day? Like, I'm, I'm sure R is up there. Are there any, any things that, um, that you can speak to that might be good to learn for students now? I just, I love R. I use it every single day, all the time. So I think <laughs> I'm seeing nodding. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in terms of databases, we have SQL. So, so being familiar with that, um, I think, you know, it's not too challenging, I think, to, to be able to write, write some queries. Um, and, uh, Python does get used. I think that's more of a, like, personal stylistic preference thing you know I, I don't think anyone would hopefully turn you away if you could code in python equally as well as other people can code in r or vice versa what i would just say to that end is i've heard historically that python is easier to pick up um you know if, if you're already a, a programmer but having gotten into this with basically no coding experience i found r really intuitive um, for that type of background and i think r has a bit more of you know a, a statistic 
technical specific focus rather than being more of a, a broad based language that you can do a ton of other stuff with. But for me, that's all I care about. So I'm, I'm super happy with R and I think it's a great language to pick up, especially if, if you're kind of new to, to coding in general. And I'm a baby R user, but I'm team R nonetheless. <laughs> um, but I would add on top of that advice, depending on what you're working on and on your audience, if you are going into the visualization space. I mean, ggplot is great, but also Tableau can be a really valuable add to your skill set um, in terms of presenting. We talk about putting your work out for people to see. That's a really accessible way for people to see what you've done and also play with what you've done, which can really connect you to your audience as well. So I just, if it fits with what you're doing and what your goals are, Tableau can be valuable. I'm also team R. Um, our studio is all of my life. So um, I I would say though, like if you are deciding between like R and Python, it honestly doesn't matter as long as you're really proficient in one of them. Um, that's really all you need. Um, and also like I like we we knock on Excel a lot, but it is really useful to be proficient in Excel. Like don't just have that as a line on your resume. Like actually be proficient in Excel, be able to. Um, you know, if you want to filter like the data, at least like know the very basics um, about using Excel, that's more useful than you would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can't say any of those answers were unexpected, but it's great to, great to hear them for people that are getting interested in sports. Um, so just uh, one more question, just to give some closing thoughts, um, if and anyone can answer. Uh, if you could talk to yourself from a few years ago, uh, and give them some advice, uh, about you know how to progress in your career in sports analytics is there anything that you know now that you'd say to them it's kind of an on the spot you know interview type question but it's it's a good way to you know get some closing thoughts going i'm not gonna lie um a couple of years ago i wasn't even aware that what i'm currently doing was even a job um so like during junior year of college was when i like realize that like oh my gosh this is something I could actually do um so I guess like telling myself that this is not something that I could actually do would if that counts as advice or not um but also just doing projects would be my biggest recommendation to myself because the only way you get experience is by doing these things yourself not just like reading other people's work but all, like trying to do that yourself um it's been really helpful in my career. Yeah, this is a this is a fun question. I, I kind of feel similarly, like if you go back like five years or whatever, I would have just been like, that's not a thing that can happen to me ever. So um, I think, you know, what I would say, uh, just thinking back to my undergrad days, I feel like I spent a lot of time just like being very nervous about the fact that I wasn't working for a hedge fund like everyone else at business school and you know what was I doing with my life and was I ever going to find a job and all of that um, so I think what I would say is like given that I knew very early on that I loved stats and I loved research the great thing about that type of career is that you can focus on you can do projects on what you're interested in like sports um, and and use that as a way to learn more about stats and more about modeling things like that and then you know even if you don't end up working in sports like even if you work in a completely different field just having those types of, of skills and knowledge are really valuable like again i i I've done tons of sports research, but I feel like if I had to change industries, obviously I would have to try to acquire as much domain knowledge as possible. But in general, my skill set could be applied elsewhere. So I think, you know, maybe that would <laughs> cut down on some of the anxiety that I was feeling through undergrad a lot. Yeah, I don't have much more to add other than I think it's um, listen to your inner voice. I, you know, there are times that I've thought about things I, figured I should learn or figured I should pursue. Um, and if I had just done it when I felt about it, I, I probably would not have had as much stress either. Um, but I think the biggest lesson I've learned, particularly, I mean, right now, I'm, this is a dream opportunity for me. I couldn't, every day I kind of walk around and go, what is happening? It's shocking. Um, is just, you know, stick with it and be true to your passion and continue to be present and engage in things for yourself. Um, we all have goals, but 
we all have one life too. So pursue what's exciting to you and interesting to you. And that's, what's going to connect you to the opportunities that feed that as well as your success. Well, that's great to hear. And um, yeah, I think that just about brings us to our time. So uh, to all three of you, I want to say thank you so, so much. We really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to us. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation as much as I have. It went by so fast. I can't believe that it's been 45 minutes already. Um, and we hope everyone in the audience has appreciated this as well. Thanks for your questions. Um, moving on from here uh, in room one, uh, that's not this room, just in case you didn't know, room one, we have uh, our analytics and sports media panel taking place from 3.15 to 4 o'clock. Um, so if you're interested, you can always jump over there. Um, yeah, again, thank you ladies all for taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate it and um, we're happy to have heard from you. <laughs>